Good morning, everybody. John Holland here, Chief Development Officer of Pynchon, based in Vancouver. Welcome to our webinar on underoccupied buildings, risk to remember uh, regarding COVID-19. Um, this is the second we, we presented this webinar yesterday uh, as well, and uh, we well, but I welcome you all to the, to the presentation. Um, as we speak, many organizations are in the midst of reoccupying or have reoccupied, some forced by government uh, sanctions, some voluntarily, some forced by just the way they operate. And in an era where we have gone through a, uh, the uncertainty of a Delta variant, surging cases in some parts of the country, there's an even greater pressure on uh, building owners, operators, and managers to put in controls and procedures to make sure that reoccupancy mandate is done as safely as possible. And Pynchon, as part of our service to our client community and our broader community, we bring our lessons to uh, all of you on what we've learned through our work with COVID-19, through our occupational health and safety, and indoor environmental quality practice. So today is about sharing those learnings with you. Um, we have two presenters today, Steve Booth, uh, who is the Director of Indoor Air Quality OHS and Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety and Hazardous Materials, the GTA. He is, has more than 20 years of infection control and indoor air quality ex consulting experience. He holds a diploma in architectural technology, and he's developed standards for mold and remediation and indoor air environmental quality in Ontario through his work with the Environmental Abatement Association of Ontario. Second speaker, Mr. Chris Taylor, and they'll be handing off because they, uh, they have different um, takes, different uh, parts of this presentation. Chris is the regional practice leader for Western Canada and Northwest Ontario for Pynchon in occupational health and safety. He joined Pynchon in 2005 as a project manager in the OHS group in Edmonton, and he became the OHS, which is occupational health and safety practice leader in 2012. Chris has a diploma in electrical engineering technology from the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. And he's a registered occupational hygiene technologist and a member of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. He's worked on over 4,000 projects all over the country, and he fulfills his role as a senior technical advisor and a reviewer uh, on many of those projects. Many of the more complex projects we do in the West come under Chris's eye. So we've got two great presenters today. So I want to thank them for part of this being part of this presentation, supported by the um, support of Katie Schwartz in Winnipeg, and I believe um, Rui Cavallo in Ontario, running the uh, running in Toronto, running the, uh, the, the Zoom webinar. Uh, if you have questions uh, as we go, we'll try and answer them as we go, or at the end, I'll be moderating that. Please use the uh, Q and A button. If you have technical issues, uh, please. Um, uh, use the uh, the chat button, and we'll try and solve that through chat. So, with that, I'm going to hand the chair over to the to our first speaker, and uh, look forward to enjoying this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, so, I'll be starting us out and kind of uh, uh, getting us into a a situation of where we're going to go today. So, we're going to take a look at some some aspects about uh, from an environmental perspective uh, what. Uh, the impacts might have been, whether it be an underused or unused building uh, related to the pandemic. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, some other aspects uh, related to why should we care about doing these things and, and, and both legally and, and morally and some of those kinds of aspects. We'll look at Legionella and, and why uh, it might be more of a risk than, than you're used to in your buildings. Uh, what about starting up? If your building has been either unused or under, uh, underutilized, what should be some of the factors that you look at? And we'll also uh, take a look at, at mold. But one of the things I'll be talking about later, I'll be handing over to, to Steve in a, in a couple of minutes, but we'll talk about maintenance and why it is really important and why it may be something that you have to sort of budget a little differently during the startup phase uh, of your buildings. So we're going to start off with the why should we care aspect, and, and this is very much in the category of, of a building management kind of aspect where, uh, especially if you've had experience with indoor air quality concerns, you know that perception of people may be entirely different than actual risk. And when we're talking about COVID-19 and the pandemic, your range of reaction from your occupants is going to be extraordinarily broad. 
you're going to have people with high levels of anxiety and, and are being asked to return uh, to a workplace under much more condensed conditions than they've done over the last 18 to 19 months. Uh, and therefore, they're going to want to see that you as a building owner operator have put protocols in place to, to control the environment uh, in, in a way that is going to make them feel safe. On the flip side, you may have people who are absolutely uh, against any restrictions entirely. And so how to manage that is, is why we talk about going through and, and doing these kinds of assessments and protocols so that you can be very clear to all of your uh, stakeholders as to what it is that you're doing. Things that we've learned. So when we started the pandemic, there was a, a great deal of concern over a variety of different uh, transmission components, whether they be uh, through aerosols, through uh, um, airborne, uh, through droplets, uh, and through contact. And one of the things that we've learned over the last uh, year and a half is that some of the transmission aspects related to contact are less than what we thought. It's not zero, we still want to look at enhanced cleaning and still uh, investigate different components, but it's certainly not what we're finding. Uh, on the flip side, uh, related to aerosols, our first early take was focused on droplets because that's the way other flus and viruses have transmitted. What we've learned is that uh, small aerosols uh, uh, are generated uh, from COVID, stay airborne much longer, and therefore the use of ventilation be has become a much more important aspect. So we, we've kind of evolved, our learning has evolved. And when we add the Delta variant, and, and now that we're looking at mu variants and Delta plus and all of these different other uh, components, we're still evolving. So it's going to be very important that you, you maintain uh, uh, your finger on what's going on. But what we're learning is that uh, contact is still important, but less so, whereas aerosol and therefore ventilation, more of a concern as we've been going along. So what should we be thinking about when we decide, is it safe to reoccupy? Or more importantly, just what are we going to do to make sure it is safe to be reoccupying? A, understand that we're in uncharted territory still. We know more, but we still don't necessarily know everything. Uh, governments are changing their protocols. I happen to be in Alberta. Uh, we've recently sort of added some lockdown components after having uh, a period where there was essentially no uh, rules. So we know that depending on your jurisdiction, things may change. We know the science uh, changes and therefore what is a reasonable level of precaution? Uh, what can you do to demonstrate due diligence? And that's kind of what we're gonna get into today and what we feel are the things that you can do to be able to demonstrate that due diligence going forward. Biggest thing is a risk assessment, going through and understanding what you are doing in your building and what you have been doing. Uh, so if you were unused, what does that mean? If you were underused, what does that talk about and, and how those impacts? And, and Steve will go into some of those and I'll go into some of those uh, things to be looking at. Uh, and then what is then your solution going to be? And I will focus very much on communication. Uh, one of the questions we got in yesterday's session is, you know, what kinds of things we can do? Uh, and, and both Steve and I were talking about how important making sure that you are communicating clearly. If you're going to go the extra mile for your uh, tenants uh, and for the occupants of your building, you want to make sure that they're aware of that so that you can help deal with that anxiety component that they might have coming back into your building. Whatever you're doing, it is worthwhile making sure that all of your stakeholders uh, are aware of it. So I've used a couple of terms so far this morning, and that is under-occupied or uh, uh, underutilized versus unoccupied or, or, or unused. And just to give you an idea of sort of the visual description of what we're talking about, there's definitely been buildings that represent uh, over the past uh, year and a half, uh, the picture on the left, where basically everybody was at home. Uh, now we're moving to the picture on the right, uh, which would be the pre-pandemic component, uh, where we're now bringing our occupancy back up to pre-pandemic levels. But the reality is, is that still most businesses or a lot of businesses, maybe is a better way of putting it, are going to be this in-between. 
uh, everything from understanding that uh, employees like working from home in certain environments to uh, reduced uh, need for uh, real estate footprints uh, to just an ongoing concern of operational aspects of not wanting to have all of your staff in the building at the same time. You don't want all your eggs in one basket in case there is an outbreak. So this is probably where you're going to find a lot of your uh, stakeholders uh, in, which is this in-between uh, position, which which may have an impact on how you use your building systems. So that kind of gives you a bit of a, a structure of, of where we're going to uh, start off with. And uh, to kick us off on some of the more specifics, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Steve Booth, who's going to talk about mold. Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to start off on mold because a number of organizations have identified, you know, a couple of potential risks that uh, they see. So the AIHA and the CDC have both highlighted a couple of risks, mold and Legionella in particular, as real concerns um, for occupants when we start coming back and reoccupying the buildings after a period of vacancy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, on, on the mold side of things, uh, we'll talk about how and, you know, when that happens. But, you know, pre-pandemic, really you had you know, maybe thousands of sets of eyes in the building looking at uh, the building every single day. So we have a, you know, a small roof leak or a small plumbing leak or a drain overflow happen. Chances are someone was on site and found that, if not, when it happened the next morning when people came into the office. But, you know, with the buildings being, you know, much less lower occupied, you know, there's certainly a possibility that some of these things have uh, have not been uncovered. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, there we go. I've got control now, I think. Uh -oh. There we go. Um, so let's start off just to talk a little bit about, you know, what mold is and, and, and how, and then a few slides on how it gets into our buildings. And so there are three sort of uh, kingdoms of living things. So there are animals, there are plants, and then somewhere in between those animals and plants, there are the fungi. And the, the fungi are, you know, plant-like in a way in that they, you know, grow on surfaces. Uh, but unlike plants, they don't uh, use sunlight to create, uh, chlor use chlorophyll to create energy from sunlight. So they, their primary role in the environment is decay, um, Get leaves in the forest, dead animals, all those kind of things. So uh, the, the fungi are a part of that uh, decay process in, in their niche in nature. And the, and the problem with that is that the same thing they try and do in nature, they try and decay our buildings when, uh, when our buildings get wet. So when our buildings get wet, stay wet, um, you know, mold can begin to grow and actually eat away at our building surfaces. And they chiefly reproduce through spores. So spores, uh, these spores are present in the air all the time. They settle out on our building surfaces all the time. They're in our, in our ceiling spaces, in our wall cavities. And then when something gets wet, they're essentially like seeds waiting to start to grow. And they start to grow very quickly after they get wet. So within, a, within about 12 hours of getting wet, they begin to put out hyphae or roots into the substrate. And within three to 10 days, those roots start to produce their own spores. So you may have had some settled spores in a wall cavity um, from spores that got brought in through the air, which is normal. But once you start growing the mold on the wall, you go from a few spores in a square inch, maybe hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of spores per square inch once the mold starts to grow. So the key here really is to get things dried out quick, identify leaks when they happen, get things dried out very quickly. So the guidelines really give us 24 to 48 hours to get things dry or at least substantially dry to avoid mold growth. And this mold we see in the photograph here is about six days after a loss in a small office complex that we looked at a number of years ago. But it doesn't take very long for things to get significantly moldy and those dark spots are the spores forming. So the, the problem with our buildings is if they get wet or there, frankly, or if there's high humidity for an extended period of time, almost all the surfaces in our building can grow mold. And this slide and the photograph on that right here really illustrate the different levels of susceptibility in materials. So 
the, the kind of processed wood materials that we, you know, fill our buildings with, like drywall with paper, um, you know, uh, older linoleum flooring with a with a jute back or, or carpet, uh, you, um, or some organic carpet fibers. You know, those things are highly susceptible to mold growth, and they get moldy first. But really, all of the things can grow mold growth. So although you know the wood doesn't appear particularly moldy in this photograph, given enough time, mold will colonize those wood surfaces as well. And although things like steel ductwork and concrete floors, uh, you know, can't grow mold on themselves because they don't have organic materials for the mold to draw nutrients from, the dust and dirt that accumulates on these building finishes over time is more than enough to support mold growth. In fact, we've seen mold growing on surfaces of glass from time to time, just because there's a, lay, a film of dirt on the surface. So, you know, if we don't keep things dry and keep our humidity low, almost all of the surfaces in our buildings are susceptible to mold growth. Uh, you know, so just some common problems. We see a lot of issues around roof leaks that go unnoticed for a period of time. You know, we see, you know, wet ceiling tiles in an office space from a recurring leak. And maybe the ceiling tiles don't get replaced and just get wetted over and over again, maybe someone's painting over them or putting the wet ceiling tile above ceiling and dropping a new ceiling tile in. All those over time, that repeated wetting can result in mold. Plumbing leaks, usually, uh, you know, you have a pressurized system and that begins to leak. That's, you know, that generates a lot of water over a, over a period of time. So it gets noticed pretty quickly. Uh, and then hopefully you can take the action to dry it up. But um, sanitary drain leaks, you know, it can sometimes be intermittent. So it only leaks a little bit of water when the toilet takes flush or when the, when the dishwasher runs or when, you know, whatever the situation is. So those tend to be harder to identify for the building occupants and for facility staff. And, you know, that those problems also result in this kind of long-term moisture inside a wall cavity that can sometimes grow more mold than these one-off a pipe burst we got in there, we cleaned it up quickly, and we got everything dried out. Condensation is an issue, and one thing that Chris is going to talk about later on is uh, some recommendations from ASHRAE around maintaining uh, building relative humidity in the 40 to 60 percent zone to minimize uh, uh, the transmission of COVID through uh, droplet nuclei and um, to sort of keep our respiratory systems in the best shape to prevent infection. The problem is that in Canadian buildings in the winter, um, if you're keeping a building at 40% relative humidity, you are likely to end up with condensation on the windows almost definitely. And you have a sense of very good chance of ending up with condensation inside wall cavities and various locations that you can't see that could lead to mold growth. So we have to be very cautious when we look at uh, humidification in built Canadian buildings during winter months and, you know, uh, in discussions with our building science team, I mean, most buildings, even really well-constructed ones with top-notch paper barriers and windows, can't support much more than, say, 25% relative humidity uh, through the winter. So that's something to keep in mind. And then, so there are two sides to this coin. So there's some mold growth that we can see on the surface. So, you know, we may walk through and see something like this, where there's been a leak from this... Uh, you know, wash sink over the period of time in, in a janitor's closet somewhere. Uh, but what we have to try and understand, I think, is that very often what we can see on the surface, so if you're already seeing mold growth like that on the surface, there's likely much, much more mold growth inside that wall cavity. So the, that those exposed surfaces tend to dry out the most quickly because there's air circulation and all kinds of things happening. So it dries and doesn't get all that moldy. Water inside the wall cavity you know, soaked up in insulation like we see here, has very little opportunity to dry out. So things stay wetter for a much longer period of time inside the wall cavity uh, and can grow mold. And the issue from an occupant point of view is it really doesn't matter whether the molds on the surface of the wall are it or on the wall cavity. There are pathways for that mold to get out of the wall cavity and for people to be exposed and to cause those kind of health effects. So that uh, really wraps up the talk on mold. And the next thing, uh, and, and you know, it's something we've probably paid less attention to over the past, you know, many years than, than mold in buildings is Legionella. And so Legionella is a bacteria that 
causes a very specific couple of diseases, the most serious of which is called Legionnaire's disease. And it was first identified back in 1976 in a hotel in Philadelphia where there was an American Legion convention. So that's how it gets its name. Um, and, you know, during this convention, there were a number of individuals who came down with a very serious respiratory infection, fever, and difficulty breathing. 35% of the people that attended were hospitalized, and there were 34 deaths as a result. And the Center for Disease Control back in the 70s did an investigation uh, and determined that it was the, the respiratory disease was called by, caused by a bacteria called Legionella pneumophila. And Legionella pneumophila had been growing in the cooling tower. So a lack of you know, adequate treatment of the water there and warm water conditions have allowed this bacteria to grow. And then the, the, the plume from the cooling tower had disseminated the, vir the bacteria out to uh, the occupants in the hotel who had then become infected. And so the bacteria causes two diseases and we'll talk, the first one is more serious. So Legionnaire's disease is that, uh, the more serious disease and it's a bacterial pneumonia. It's caused when you inhale this bacteria in small aerosolized water droplets. It occurs within two to 10 days of exposure. You end up with flu-like systems, chest pains, high fever, pneumonia, and death. And in some ways, you know, these kind of symptoms could be overlapping with COVID illness as well. So um, the, the big difference, well, there's lots of difference between this and COVID, but one of the biggest differences, it's pretty easy to treat Legionnaire's disease if you identify it early, early on. So if you understand it's Legionnaire's disease, you get the person to the hospital, they get on antibiotics at that point in time, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to treat. It does still though have a fatality rate of 10 to 15%. Uh, the other, you know, fundamental difference between it and something like COVID is that it's not contagious between people. You can catch it from the water features at the building, but, but once I have it, I can't be coughing at home and spread it to anyone else that I come across. It's only transmissible from the water source to the individual, not between people. And there are about 6,000 cases of Legionnaire's disease reported in the US. Um, this is thought to be a bit of an underreporting because there are actually two diseases that result from Legionnaire's disease. One is this you know, very serious iteration and probably a lot of that gets caught. But uh, some patients also get something called Pontiac fever, which is more you know, a mild flu or a very bad cold. And then they recover from that uh, fairly quickly. And uh, of course that then probably doesn't get reported the vast majority of the time. I don't go to my doctor and say, I have a bit of a cold, can you test me for Legionnaire's disease um, or, or Legionella bacteria infection? So it's probably underreported. There are some risk factors around it. So uh, heavy alcohol consumption, tobacco smoking, and age are all, uh, advanced age are all increase the risk of catching the disease and uh, how severe it is. I will say though, this isn't a disease that only affects those people. Uh, you know, even healthy young individuals can uh, be infected with le uh, the Legionella bacteria from water systems and buildings. So it's not restricted to those. The roots of exposure again are these very small droplets of water that are generated from the plume in a cooling tower or a faucet aerator or a shower head or an eye wash station or any of those kind of things where there's water and there's a little bit of mist created from the water. Um, uh, misting stations are in fact a potential spreader as well uh, that people use for sort of outdoor air conditioning facilities. And the, the bacteria responsible, so this Legionella bacteria is really present in all surface water. So lakes, streams, um, all those kind of things contain small amounts of Legionella, uh, which is how it gets into our building. So it's brought in, um, you know, with our domestic water. Um, Legionella pneumophila is only one species of a larger family of Legionella, but that's Legionella pneumophila is really the only one or the one that causes the vast majority of the, the cases of Legionnaires. And then within this Legionella pneumophila um, uh, species, there are also uh, serogroups, so uh, slight variations on that species. And um, although there are several strains, only serogroup one, four, and six are responsible for disease with the vast majority of them related to one. 
So that's something important to consider when you're looking at a lab. They need to identify species of Legionella and they need to identify which sero groups they are, which strains they are as well, because that's important too, whether it's a real problem or not. The chain of transmission, I think we kind of covered this, but you know, it's present in lakes, rivers, and streams outside. It comes into reservoirs through our um, you know, municipal water systems. That gets aerosolized in some way, taps, showers, uh, cooling towers. People breathe in the mist from that. And then, you know, depending on how much they breathe in, their immune system and a whole bunch of factors, they potentially become infected. But that's where the transmission chain ends. That infected host can't spread it any farther after that point in time. Uh, they are not infectious to other people. So that's very important to understand. Um, there is an influence of water temperature. So how hot you keep your hot water in particular matters a lot. So Legionella likes to grow in the 20 degrees Celsius to 49 degrees Celsius zone. Uh, if once water gets to around 49 degrees Celsius, growth slows down and the bacteria begin to die off uh, very quickly at temperatures above 70 degrees. So we want to keep our Wa our hot water, you know, certainly above that 50 degrees Celsius mark to slow and, and, and limit the amount of uh, Legionella growth that might happen in those systems. And really that range between 30 and 42 degrees Celsius, that's, that's the sweet spot. So bacteria, the bacteria really likes to proliferate in our systems at that level. The other thing that can have an influence on uh, Legionella bacteria in your buildings is biofilm. So the, the bacteria and gunk that grows on the wall of the cooling tower sump or inside a corroded pipe, um, that biofilm can actually protect the Legionella bacteria and other bacteria from the disinfectants that we might use, whether that's chlorine in the water system, the potable water system, or whether that's whatever treatment chemicals we're using in our cooling tower, uh, that biofilm really acts as a barrier and the, the bacteria can hide out essentially in the biofilm and, and not be impacted. And then when the biofilms in pipe systems, when there are shutdowns around, um, around the work, uh, when there are shutdowns, you know, the, the shape in the water system, the refilling the system, can dislodge the biofilm and result in really high uh, concentrations. But the other thing, so one of the places where we see Legionella accumulate is in dead legs. So we've traditionally thought of dead legs as uh, the condition where you had a system, you've, let's, say, let's say a water fountain in your office, no one was drinking out of the water fountain, you decided to disconnect it, but you didn't remove the plumbing. So that section from the riser to the water fountain that never has any flow is a dead leg. And that water there is stagnant with little disinfectant in it, if any, and bacteria, Legionella, and others can grow within that space. So, um, and, you know, if you think about our, you know, very low occupancy buildings without a flushing system in place, really, you know, many of our runs from the riser to the tap have become dead legs over the period of time. And that's why we're seeing you know, some impacts from Legionella in some of the offices that we're doing testing in now. So when we're talking about these dead legs, this stagnant water issue can result in Legionella growth, but it can also result in leaching of metals like lead from uh, lead solder that might be near pipes. And it can result in other kind of bacterial contamination that might be an issue from a drinking water point of view. Um, so what we're seeing from clients right now are a, a bunch of questions. You know, do I have Legionella and we're doing testing to help direct to determine that? Um, what do you need to do because my building's got low occupancy? How do I flush my building? What kind of testing do I do and how do I compare my results? So to look at the flushing guidance, there's lots of it available online. Um, so the AHA have an excellent document that Canadian uh, Water and Wastewater Association uh, the province of Quebec and the CDC all provide guidance on flushing, which essentially says, um, you know, to have maintenance staff in the building, uh, you know, running the taps on a regular basis to uh, flush those systems to sort of emulate the operation you would have had when the building was operable. And that just keeps that stagnant water from accumulating. Um, when it comes to, you know, testing and results, there are not, again, there are lots of standards available for building operators, I think this MD15161 from Public Works Government Services Canada, or PSPC now, 
um, you know, provides a lot of guidance on how to, how to deal with disinfection and what criteria when you're doing testing should you be comparing the results. So that's um, an excellent Canadian standard that uh, we can certainly be looking at. Um, when we're sampling for Legionella, you know, generally you're using sterile bottles that are sent by the lab. Um, we're shipping those back and back to the lab in a cooler pack with some freezer packs because we don't want Legionella to be growing in the bottle on the way to the lab. We want to keep it nice and cold so that the growth is inhibited. Um, and then really you want to get the, the samples back to the lab as quickly as possible. So sampling on Friday is not usually a good idea because uh, that arrives at the lab on Saturday. It might sit around for a weekend until someone picks it up. And you want to get it back sort of within at least 48 hours, preferably uh, the next day. When we're looking for a lab, we want to make sure that the lab is accredited. So ISO 17025 is the accreditation for Legionella analysis. Ideally, the lab should be CDC elite uh, certified as well. And look for a lab that can give you some proactive results. So the Legionella culturing process takes 10 days. Uh, labs usually do an inspection of the, on a rough count uh, five days in. Uh, if there's already a problem at five days in, there's going to be a problem at 10 days in. So the, some labs will give you a bit of a heads up to say, hey, we've got 20 of your samples in. Five days in, you know, three quarters of them are already showing counts that are pretty high. And that allows you to take some action earlier rather than later. There are really three methods, uh, culturing, kind of the gold standard, uh, qPCR, which is, um, uh, you know, looks at the DNA of the bacteria present, um, the sort of the second best way to go. And then there are a number of DIY kind of test kits that allow us to do some on-site, um, you know, rough estimates, maybe is the best way to put it, of uh, possible, possible Legionella concentrations. So, you know, what methods do we choose following these closures? Well, really, uh, we would recommend you go for the culturing method. It's really the gold standard. Um, it identifies the quantities of viable Legionella and its Legionella pneumophila and its serogroups. So you can get the species, you can get the serogroups, and because it's viable, those are the bacteria that can actually cause infection uh, because they're alive still. It's suitable for all kinds of water systems. And the results are available within seven to 10 days. Um, QPCR is the other method. So it's the advantage is that it's very quick turnaround. The disadvantage is that it can sometimes detect both living and dead bacteria uh, in, in the water system. So it potentially leads to a false positive. Um, and you can also have uh, some issues where there are you know, other bacteria present or there are lots of uh, chemical residues present, present, and that can cause difficulty with the analysis. But we have found it's very, very useful. So if you identify a problem using culturing, you can flush the system extremely well to try and get that bacteria out of the water system. And then to confirm that that flushing has been effective, you can go back and do qPCR testing. So that is how we've been using it in our practice. So the, the, the summary here is really just to do your due diligence to maintain and monitor your building water systems to try and keep that risk of Legionella down. And that's really means sort of keeping the hot water temperatures up in the range uh, where growth is inhibited and by, uh, by, by doing a flushing system on, the, on the, both the cold and hot water system. So stuff is instead of sitting stagnant or not creating dead legs to do some sampling for Legionella before we reopen the building so that we know we you know, aren't bringing in people in um, back worrying about one respiratory illness and then potentially exposing them to a cause of another respiratory illness. Um, using that culture method of analysis because it gives you all the information you need and then using the QPCR to monitor the efficacy of any decontamination that you might've had to do. And with that, I think I will pass it back to Chris. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, it, it's this, this idea of uh, I'm now going to build on what Steve sort of talked about. And, and let's focus now on some practical aspects of, of the startup uh, process. So uh, 
based on on a variety of different things and based a little bit on what Steve talked about, I'm going to really focus on two main uh, items, and that's the HVAC system and potable water. I can tell you that um, I, I go out and do uh, building life safety audits and so on. And during the pandemic, we've seen issues with fire extinguishers not being inspected and other life safety systems. But from a COVID point of view, it's really going to be about these, these two aspects. And on the water side, I'm going to talk about potable water, but I'm going to sort of as an aside include uh, water features. So if you had fountains uh, or other component or any place where there might be an opportunity for uh, a the aerosolization of mist uh, and a chance for stagnant water, all of those same things that, that Steve's been talking about may be possible. So we've seen this in fountains. Uh, we've seen this in, in, in other components. So uh, it isn't just about your cooling systems anymore. And that's where the, the Legionella I, I aspect is, is broadened out uh, under the pandemic. But let's uh, start with uh, the ventilation systems uh, and, and some strategies and, and things to, to look at. Um, number one, uh, what kind of resources are out there? Well, ASHRAE, uh, which is the American Society for Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, uh, they're always a, a, a go-to resource. They're, you know, uh, Steve's been talking about gold standard in testing. In my mind, they're the gold standard in, in ventilation. Uh, they have provided a, a fair bit of good guidance uh, on this. And, and if we're trying to kind of grind down their guidance into some key points, uh, more fresh air, better filtration, uh, and, and humidity. And we'll talk about the issues with humidity uh, uh, that Steve's uh, already brought up. But those are really their, their guidance. And we'll also then talk a little bit about some of the, the issues related to that. On the ventilation side, uh, the reason why we talk about more uh, is kind of illustrated by these two graphics. In the graphic on the left, you've got a, either a symptomatic or asymptomatic individual shedding virus, uh, but there is fresh air coming in and that fresh air is, is either diluting uh, that situation, or hopefully it's it's pumping it uh, out through the exhaust. Whereas with the graphic on the right, where there is a lack of ventilation uh, or no uh, fresh air, that aerosolization is allowed for the smaller components to stay airborne. Uh, the droplets, that two meter distancing still works for us, but for the smaller uh, aerosols that will stay airborne, the advantage of more fresh air is that because they're airborne, they're easily moved out uh, and, and into the exhaust system. So we, we absolutely want to be thinking about it. Now we're moving into the winter season. I'm in Edmonton. We've already had uh, a couple of uh, frost warnings uh, in our environment. So you're in that shoulder season where we would move into a, a time of year where we would often be reducing the amount of fresh air down to 60%, uh, you know, or 50% in terms of fresh versus recirculated. And so one of the things you want to be thinking about is keeping that fresh air component, keeping that uh, recirculation component low and the fresh air hot, which does have an impact on systems. It has an impact on heating. It has an impact on cost. Uh, but it is one way that you can do to uh, reduce the amount of virus uh, in, in your in your buildings. Some of the other things we're going to look at is uh, drafts, uh, and and really I, I want to talk about it from the point of view of of high velocity air uh, as opposed to necessarily what we might traditionally think of as a draft uh, filtration, uh, humidity, which uh, Steve's already talked about, um, amount of fresh air, and 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 then maintenance, which I, I indicated is going to be a, a big component. With drafts, this, this graphic actually uh, came from very, very early on in the pandemic. This is, is, is actually from uh, uh, a period of time uh, in January, February of, of last year and related to a restaurant uh, in uh, Southeast Asia where it was quite clearly confirmed or they, they felt very strong that they were able to confirm that uh, people at table C who were uh, either symptomatic or asymptomatic shed virus and a high velocity air conditioner was blowing that uh, uh, downwind and uh, confirmed cases happened downwind of that table. Uh, I know that uh, we were doing an investigation at a warehouse uh, in Calgary and they had a cooling fan. This was now more the middle of the summer last year uh, and had a cooling fan on a assembly line type table system, uh, high velocity air, 
downwind impact and a clear, clear transmission path uh, based on that higher velocity air. We normally think of building HVAC systems, they're, they're a relatively low velocity. It's these higher velocity situations or draft situations that we want to try and avoid uh, as much as possible. So one of the things that we uh, find are issues is uh, things that your building occupants do to mess up all of your good hard work in balancing your HVAC. You may go through and do a really good job and get your, your building operators and your, your uh, HVAC suppliers to, to work with you to build a good balance within your system. Uh, and then you walk along through some of the occupied areas and everybody's got a desk fan. Um, these are usually, if I'm doing a normal indoor air quality investigation, that's an indicator to me that we've got people who are unhappy with the air. But now they may be a situation where if there is a nearby downwind person impacted, that things that are completely out of your control uh, are now being impacted within that, that space. So we, we want to try and message to our, our, our clients, to our stakeholders, that anything that involves locally uh, ventilated items, if they're not part of a plan, they're just going to make things potentially worse. So things like desktop fans and, and some of those kinds of things uh, may be a, a problem that are that are hard to control. So seeing what's going on inside your, your spaces uh, can be useful as well. But really, it's about getting that good balance uh, within your system. Uh, in terms of filtration, here's where we have both a win and a potential loss. Uh, ASHRAE indicates that uh, they'd like to see you go to a MERV 13 or better, um, and that that will improve. That MERV 13 uh, provides a filtration level uh, that captures uh, the size of aerosol that we typically see with COVID. The downside, of course, is that the minute you increase your ventilation, your airflow may now decrease. If you haven't got the fan, uh, they haven't got the oomph to pump that air through that filter, now we may be reducing the amount of fresh air uh, in our system. So it's basically going to be a case of, I don't want to reduce that amount of fresh air. I, I want to filter, and the better the filter the pot that I can use, the better. But the more fresh air is, is as much a value to us uh, as anything. Uh, those aerosols that are, if you are recirculating, uh, are probably uh, uh, depositing out in, in, in the ductwork in many cases. So if I was leaning, I would say, you know, get the most filtration that your system can handle, but focus on, on fresh air. But MERV 13 or better is what ASHRAE indicates we should be looking for. Here's where the maintenance comes in. When we're doing inspections, probably uh, the number one thing that we see is either damage to filter banks uh, where there are clear penetrations or, or where people have uh, either ill-fitting or misfitting or they've grabbed the filters that they've had and they've stuck them in there. And in both these pictures, uh, we may have very good filters that aren't really doing anything because with the openings available, uh, it's going, air is going to find the easiest path through and, and you're just not going to get the filtration that you need. So making sure that you go through and, and inspect all of your systems. Uh, we've experienced with a lot of our clients that particularly last year, uh, as a cost savings measure, if you were trying to uh, uh, look at cost savings on staffing, that the amount of hours, the amount of, uh, as Steve talked about, eyes on your system may have been reduced. And so uh, this is where if you're planning on restarting or uh, upgrading uh, your utilization of your building systems, planning for some extra maintenance time to be able to go through and really do a hard inspection, not just your normal inspections, but a real step-by-step -step inspection of all of your operating systems is, is going to have value because there just may not have been the amount of eyes on, on these things that, uh, that uh, you would normally see in normal operating situations. Steve talked about this. Uh, ASHRAE really would like you to have uh, humidity between 40 and 60%, but in the winter, um, that, that's going to lead to, to other issues. What I will say is that uh, Health Canada and, and other uh, authorities really indicate that once you drop that humidity below 20%, the reason why that's an impact is it dries out the mucous membranes uh, in our respiratory system. There's a reason why we normally get colds and flus in the winter. 
Uh, as that uh, mucous membrane system in our, our throats and our respiratory system dries out, it makes us more susceptible for the virus to take hold. Uh, again, I'm in Edmonton, we would routinely see relative humidity in the 11% range in February, which is, is just complete dry, dry air. And that is absolutely going to be an increased uh, factor for, for virus to take hold. So uh, while 40 to 60 is our, our, our target, what I will say is with the balance of looking for condensation, so if you're not seeing condensation and you can get kind of above that 20% range, that might be where you're trying to manage uh, and balance risk reward in this kind of scenario, just like the filtration. Uh, better filtration, good, but reduced air, bad. So how do I find uh, that balance? If you're seeing condensation, the risk for mold and damage to your building systems is probably greater than dropping that humidity uh, down a little bit uh, into that lower range. So inspect, go through and do that hard inspection on any of your wet systems, certainly, uh, looking for evidence of biofilms, looking for evidence of mold, uh, looking for obstructions, things like uh, louvers, uh, if they haven't uh, been looked at in a while, are they either locked open or locked shut? Uh, we've had situations where it, even on computer controlled systems, the computer control says the louvers are open, but when you visually inspect them, uh, the louvers are, 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 are in a closed position because they're stuck. Uh, so going through and, and really doing an eyes on inspection of your entire system, almost like a, a startup phase, like if you were commissioning the building, is absolutely uh, going to be valuable uh, as you get yourself back to full occupancy. Uh, and then from there, get back into your normal uh, maintenance activities. And uh, that that's just trying to get us back into normal operating. But there's going to be what I'll call a burp in maintenance uh, as you start these buildings back up, uh, where you should expect uh, extra time, extra energy uh, for your building operators to inspect your systems. On the potable water side, and again, I'm going to I'll talk about potable water, but I'm including uh, any sort of water feature type uh, environment. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. And, and Steve alluded to this, but I'll give you some experience from some of the things that we found over the last year. Um, in the lower mainland, one of the things that we found over years of, of water testing, uh, originally for lead and now for starting up of buildings, is that the water supply seems to be slightly acidic. Uh, so from the municipal water supplies, you have water that's in the pH of around six range. And so if that acidic water has been sitting stagnant, not only do you have the, the Legionella biofilm kind of concern, but now you've got a situation where there may have been corrosion occurring uh, and enough corrosion leads to pinhole leaks. And these pinhole leaks, depending on where they occur, lead to that kind of thing that Steve was talking about related to that hidden mold. So going through and getting eyes on as much of your, your plumbing systems as you can, looking for evidence of water leaks, uh, because absolutely what we've found is that, uh, that this has been an issue in, in certain systems. Uh, we've had a couple of clients that have tried using shock chlorination on buildings that were completely uh, not being used. And, and what they've found is that it becomes very difficult to actually funnel the chlorine, uh, the shock chlorine system through all the piping. Uh, or that if they're flushing, they, they, they want to go through and turn all the taps on at once, but the water pressure uh, doesn't get the type of water pressure that would help in reducing that biofilm. Uh, so that's where the testing component comes in that, that Steve alluded to. You can go through all of these things, but it's still probably really valuable to, especially from a communication aspect, to get that testing done. If you can show some nice testing results to your, your building occupants saying, hey, we've uh, gone through, we've done a flush, we've done some testing, and uh, even though our systems were underutilized, we now have evidence that's going to go a long ways to demonstrating to your stakeholders that you really are doing more than just the, the basic due diligence. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, there is some guidance. Uh, the CDC guidance uh, is pretty good uh, when it comes to uh, water uh, systems. Uh, I see a note, uh, chlorine absolutely has corrosion issues depending on, uh, on your factor. Uh, so that's, I, I, and there's safety aspects of using chlorine that I also get a little concerned about uh, as a safety person. Uh, so I'm not 
necessarily keen on on that shock chlorination approach uh so it's more about trying to get that efficacy aspect but yeah absolutely uh chlorine is is another uh, compound that can do corrosion uh particularly on on copper based piping systems so i recommend uh, uh the nice thing about this one is it's a free document that you can access uh that provides you some additional guidance uh, other things, these are all things that uh, Steve already talked about, mold, legionella, uh, metals, uh, lead and copper particularly, uh, that we've looked into uh, in those kinds of environments. Uh, lead uh, from old lead solder, and in some cases from the municipal supply systems, and then copper through uh, a, a extraction from your copper systems. So maintenance becomes really, really critical. And, and as I say, what we have found is that uh, during the pandemic you may have reduced the number of hours uh, and so that preventive maintenance program may not have been as robust so what we urge is is understanding that there there may have to be some budget for some additional uh, uh resources during that startup phase or even if you're going from under underused to fully used uh, of going, okay, we're, we're not just in maintenance, maintaining mode, we're going to go through a startup that is going to require additional resources in the short term to get you back to your normal maintenance mode. And, and why is all of this important? Well, ultimately, it's to, to do that due diligence from a liability. You don't want a situation where a stakeholder could come back at you and say, hey, based on something you didn't do, I feel that uh, we got uh, uh COVID or we got something else related to our uh being inside your building um legionella is a big one uh, from my perspective because of its seriousness some of the other things are are are, um, are are open to some interpretation but pretty much every jurisdiction's health and safety act has some form of a due diligence clause that drives some of this as well and so if it could be shown that the average uh, building owner operator would have done the following and you didn't do that that puts you at risk of liability so it's not just about doing the right thing sometimes there is a i have to do the right thing uh, even if it is the right thing to do and that gets us to uh questions so we'll we'll bring steve back and uh open up the floor uh, either uh, through the the q a function uh or and and john's going to moderate for us uh or through uh through the chat function great presentations chris and steve thank you very much um broadly speaking you know we're going into a, a period of um the winter we're going to a period of reoccupancy uh media we all look at the media and the case counts what signals should the diligent owner be looking for to up his up his protocol up their protocols or well make, make, that their protocols are working or make recalibrations if they uh, to see they're not working yeah i think uh, if you're you know uh, if you're like me you're you're constantly looking at uh, case counts and 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 provision from provincial jurisdictions uh, i think that in some cases you're likely going to be motivated to be slightly better than what some of the jurisdictions have been doing. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be primarily driven from your provincial health authorities uh, uh, because that's what you can hang your hat on uh, from my, did I do my due diligence aspect of things. Okay, thank you. Um, and the question we always get, which is around ventilation or filters, I think the answer is going to be both. Uh, is there any preference for which technique is the most effective in uh, managing COVID? Or are you calibrating both inevitably? I think like where you can have ventilation, you're probably better with the ventilation. So the filtration is there when you're recirculating air through the system. But if you can avoid recirculating air through the system, then you, know, you don't particularly need the filtration. So you know, first and foremost, try and meet the ventilation requirements where you have to have some recirculation uh, within the space, then the filtration becomes critical. And I think where you can't, you know, where you can't meet the ventilation requirement, and we've certainly done some work in, uh, you know, school settings where the buildings aren't equipped with, maybe aren't equipped with mechanical ventilation systems at all, 
then, you know, filtration becomes a, you know, a key element of control there. So, but sort of local, you know, portable, you know, HEPA filtration units become the kind of thing that are important in, in those cases. It's, it's a mixture of the two, but ventilation would be the, you know, your first go-to if you can manage it. Great, thank you. A uh, question here on Legionella, maybe for you, Steve. You suggest that all buildings have Legionella testing or simply ones with susceptible individuals. Yeah, I think, you know, I think at this point in time, given the conditions to demonstrate that, so first off, everyone is susceptible, I think is where we start there, right? So, uh, you know, certainly if you're in a long-term care facility, or those kind of things, then Legionella testing is critical. But, you know, in those cases, those buildings have been occupied, the plumbing systems are getting used right now. It's really testing these buildings where the, the water use has been fundamentally different over the last, you know, year and a half than it was previously. So in those buildings where you haven't had anyone in the building, no one uses that tap or that eyewash station or whatever it is, you know, those are the things I would recommend testing at this point in time just to make sure, just so that you can document that, you know, as people came back in, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a concern. And what we found, you know, we found probably more Legionella in potable water systems than we had, uh, you know, thought we were going to, but on the positive side, uh, the cleanup in most cases has been pretty straightforward. So it's been a good thorough flushing of the system, sometimes involved with, you know, heating the hot water tanks up again, to, you know, above the normal uh, set point. But, and for the most part, between that superheating and flushing and purging the system, you know, we've addressed, you know, almost, well, we've addressed all the problems that we found that in, right, in office building settings anyway. I might add as well, from a risk communication aspect, you know your tenants. We've all had situations where we understand that some tenants are much more risk averse uh, than, than others. And so part of this is the understanding your systems. Uh, and that's what Steven's been, alluding, Steve's been alluding to, but also understanding your occupants. Because uh, if you can't point to that, uh, your more risk averse occupants are going to go, well, I heard that so-and-so, you know, did this and why didn't you do this? So yeah, it, it is about understanding your, your building first uh and if it was more or less being used then you may have less of a risk one more question on the same line um what if lines have been flushed as per csa z317.13 i guess follow on do you still need to test or diligence only i i think it it's it, it leans in the diligent side of things I, I, I don't think there's a regulatory requirement to test, right? But, you know, are you going to have questions asked about it? Do you want to be able to demonstrate that you did everything you could? If you answer those two questions, yes, I'd like to do that. Then testing, um, and we're not talking about testing every fixture in the building. So, like, we've developed a system where we're doing, a, you know, what we call a screening level testing at the facility where, uh, you know, a small percentage of the hot water tanks and uh, uh, the, you know, the water main coming into the building uh, and sort of the most remote fixtures from the hot water tank and the, where the, and the cold water where it comes in, we're testing those. You know, that level of screening testing doesn't cost a lot of money, but it gives you some confidence that the flushing you've been doing has been effective through that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're coming to the end. It's uh, two minutes to the hour. Uh, so I'd like to thank. Go ahead, Steve. See the question uh, about humidification. I didn't see it. So, was there any recommendations on the best way to raise humidity other than a good old humidifier? And the, the answer is really the only way you're going to raise humidification is through some kind of a humidification system. Uh, you know, our general indoor air quality advice is to avoid you know, portable, personal humidification units on desks. Uh, depending on the type, you can develop particulate issues with them. You can, you know, over humidify and cause problems. 
uh, you know, if humidity is an issue, you want to address it, look at an engineered solution where there's, um, you know, a steam humidification system like installed in the air handling equipment is, is, is the way to go. Uh, it's not something we recommend very often, like, you know, much the same as Chris talked about, we often see a relative humidity in buildings in the 10 or 11 percent over the winter and you know it's frankly something that Canadians have learned to live with it's not <laughs> ideal but um, uh, you know unless you're willing to invest in a proper humidification system for the property um, I wouldn't recommend throwing a bunch of portable units around. Yeah we've even seen issues with portable units and again if there's standing water or stag drip trays and things like that where now we're back to legionella concerns. So uh, you, you try solving one problem and you uh, end up causing another. So unfortunately. Okay. I think with that, we'll close. We're right at uh, on the hour right now. Um, thank you very much to my presenters. Thank you to Kaylee for being in the back office. We're only moving this along. Uh, this recording will be posted on pinching.com or a link to it will be posted. And if you have any further questions, feel free to contact myself or Steve or Chris, and we'll try and answer those questions directly. Thank you to everybody, and uh, have a good and safe day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.